And at the end, end of my career, I want to be known that I was the real BMF. I was the guy that really fought the best guys in the division. The next top guy, I stood up there and I was like, all right, let me call him out. I didn't, I didn't pick and choose who I wanted to fight. I chose the best. He is the UFC welterweight champion of the world, and he makes his first defense of his title in December when he takes on Shavkat Rachmanov. At UFC 310, it is always my pleasure to speak to the great Bilal Muhammad. Bilal, how are you? My brother, I appreciate you. I'm good, man. Always good. How you feeling? I'm fantastic, man. Thank you for taking the time. Obviously, the news is out there. The first title defense is official. I feel like I had the scoop because you told me in our interview right after your fight uh, when you beat Leon Edwards, you said December. I'm thinking December, and here we are. You got to fight in December. Yeah, 100%. People are uh, coming at me, telling me this and that, and I'm just like, this is the date I wanted. This is the date I asked for. And right after that fight, this is what I was targeting. So uh, we got what we wanted. Now uh, it's just time to go out there and perform. Now, I never I never fault anyone for taking some time off. I mean, you did go five hard rounds. I mean, I know you originally said you wanted to turn around and fight in Abu Dhabi. Obviously, that would have been really quick. <laughs> um, but I don't fault guys for taking a little time off fights. So you're actually coming back faster than the typical turnaround for a champion, late July, early December. So was there ever any hesitation, or was this always the plan? No, for me, it's like if I'm healthy, I'd rather fight. I'd rather be in the cage. Uh, right after that fight, I basically came, went back into camp helping uh, my boy Ignacio win uh, his fight at the Sphere. And then Juliana had a fight, uh, won the title. So my gym was – a, we're a small team. So when one of us had a fight, we all have a fight. So I've been in the gym. I've been training. I've been working. Um, so now it was just like, all right, well, the date's lined up. My body feels good. I feel healthy. Basically – I had a whole year off of doing nothing, right? I was just training and getting better, and I want to fight. I love to fight. If I'm healthy, I'd rather be in the cage than outside of the cage. So for me, I'm rather – I want to be more active than less active. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I hate vacations. I hate going on – I hate not doing something. I'm like, you ever see that meme of uh, – I think it was like Kermit where he's sitting in a boat, and they're like, when you're on vacation, but you're at – uh, and you're not having, you have to act like you're having fun, but you're just thinking about the gym. That's how I always am. I'm like, I'd rather be in the gym training. That's my happy place. I love it. I love it. Now we talked when we did, when we did our post fight interview after the Leon Edwards, win. we kind of went through the contenders we talked about like, the top five or six guys, guys coming up. And of course the one we kind of targeted for next was Shavkat seemed like he was the guy. I know there was some buzz about the Usman thing just cause there seems to be a little bit of bad blood there, but was it always Shavkat? Like when you talked to the UFC, was it always Shavkat? Yeah, it was always shop cop from the from the start. Uh, the Usman thing was just right. He he wanted to talk, and if somebody's gonna talk, I'm gonna respond. Um, so that was all just like fun and games on my end. I I love talking trash. So if somebody wants the some wants to smoke, I'm gonna respond. Um, but that's how it is with a lot of these guys right now. Everybody wants to say my name. Everybody has something to say about me. Everybody uh wants to clap back, and none of them are really good at it. So for me, it's always about having fun with it. Uh, but I always knew that Shao would be the one that would be stepping in the cage with me anyway. Isn't it funny when you were the guy on the run, 10 fight win streak, all these kind of things, and you're calling out everybody. Nobody wanted to mention your name. You get that belt, suddenly everyone wants to call your name. That's hilarious, right? They act like they didn't know who I was. They act like <laughs> um, I didn't exist. But now, oh, man, I, I would have fought him. I never got offered him. I never did this. You know, I, I wanted to have – they offered me three rematches with Kobe, a rematch with Masvidal, and, you know, I wanted the tougher guy instead. Get out of here, man. All these guys are all liars. They are all just want that attention now. And at the end of the day, I'm the one with the belt. I'm the one with the gold. And I know that they're going to be calling my name. So I'm ready to respond. It doesn't really matter to me. It, you have to go in there, and I know who I'm going to fight. So I know the target's on Chavkat, but if these other guys want to throw that smoke and throw these words out – we, we can exchange verbal uh, uh, arguments and stuff like that. I don't care. Yeah, we'll come back to everybody else in a second. But, you know, this Shavkat fight, again, that's the one you identified right away. And you love you love these fights where guys are supposed to be kind of like the boogeyman of the division. Because you, know, you were like one of the only people for the longest time calling out Hamza Chemaev, you called, you were supposed to fight him in London. You were going to get the main event. Then it got changed. You called him out nonstop. And you were like the only guy calling him out nonstop. Uh, is there a little bit of that same feeling with Shavkat? He's undefeated, finishing, all these kind of things. He's kind of like the boogeyman. It's like you're running into a burning building. It's like you love that. 
Yeah, I do love it, right? Because I like the, for me, I love proving people wrong. I love showing people how good I am. And I love solving puzzles. I love uh, doing something that people tell me I can't do. If you tell me I can't do it, watch me show you now. And that's how this one is, right? It, it, in my last six fights, I've been the underdog. People are telling me there's no possible way I'm going to go into Manchester and beat Leon Edwards. I go out there and I make it look easy. People are telling me that Sean Brady was going to walk through me. I walk through him. I, people tell me that three weeks notice, Gilbert Burns, you're going to lose. And I keep doing it, right? I keep figuring it out. I keep winning. So it's it's nothing new to me. And I love it that it's another guy. It's another guy that they have me as an underdog for. It's another guy that they say, now there's no way he can win this one. And then afterward, I beat him. And they're going to be like, all the excuses are going to come. Well, it was too early. It was too this. It was too that. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm just going to keep building my legacy. I'm going to keep building my resume of putting all these names on there. And at the end, end of my career, I want to be known that, I was the real BMF. I was the guy that really fought the best guys in the division. The next top guy, I stood up there and I was like, all right, let me call him out. I didn't I didn't pick and choose who I wanted to fight. I chose the best. Why Why do people love to try to take away credit? You just mentioned it. Now, I was going to say, Bilal, in all honesty, like, as good as Shabcat has been, and he has been dominant, I think if there's two knocks on the guy, if I was going to make a criticism, one would be, He's never gone past the third round. He's only been in the third round like once or twice in his entire career. And this is a five-round fight. We know you have energy. We know you have cardio like the, the Energizer Bunny. You're in like the – you could be in like the 12th round and you're still going. And then part two of that is you could argue – a little bit, I would argue, that he's still a little unproven just because he didn't go through the top five guys. I'm not going to discount a win over a Wonder Boy. It's a good win. Jeff Neal's a good win, but he didn't beat the Gilbert Burnses. He didn't get through the guys that you had to get through to get here. So, But you're right, right? Like You go out there and you beat this guy immediately, they're going to say, oh, he wasn't really ready. He wasn't really the number one contender. Why do we do that? Why do people do that? That's just the world we live in, right? They're always looking. Nobody wants to clap for the guy who's went the long road. Nobody wants to clap for the guy who took the hard road out. They want to, the, they want you to fail. More people rather see you fail than they rather see you succeed. That's just like the, the TikTok world we live in, the social media world we live in. Nobody wants to see you do better than them. And for myself, right. I'm a guy that I, I work twice as hard as everybody else. Cause I know that I'm, I'm behind everybody else and nobody wants to give me credit for that. I, I didn't want, I don't have the talent that I was born with the crazy talent that most of these guys are born with or the, the experience that most of these guys are born with. So I have to work twice as hard. I have to put, you know, tie my boots every single day and train every single day, even harder and harder and harder. Um, but nobody respects that anymore. Nobody respects hard work. They all just want to see the, the, they all want to tell you it was luck. Even if I win this fight and they're going to be like, it was luck or that fight, it was luck or that fight, it was luck. Um, but nobody gives respect anymore. I just think that's just the day and age we live with. And I, and I'm okay with it because I know my family, my team, the real, the insiders, right? The people that do the sport, the coaches, those are the ones that give me the respect. Those are the ones that they know how hard it is to do what I'm doing. I haven't lost in six, seven years and I've beaten all the best guys. People that are in the sport know how hard and difficult it is. And those are the only people I really need the respect from. It's like the, uh, like the Leon Edwards thing when they say it was, you know, how, like, man, the, the time adjustment, I'm like, you do realize that Bilal fought at the same time, right? Like they both were fighting at the same time. Like this isn't like unique. It wasn't like Bilal, wasn't like Bilal was like coming in and he just had like this huge advantage. Like it's the weirdest thing. Bro, it's so funny, right? They're looking, they're, they're looking for that excuse and they're like, they're, they're telling us, they're asking guys like everyone asked Aspinall about it. Like, yeah, you know, you think that uh, it was Leon Edwards and a time change. And it was like, Aspinall knocked out Curtis Blades on that same card. And it's like, well, so you're telling me that Curtis Blades probably was affected by the time change. It's like, no, every single person from London, for the most part, all of them won. Aspinall, Patty Pimblett, Makaya was out there. It's like all of them guys won. So for you to give that excuse because Leon Edwards got dominated, no, nah, he got dominated because I'm better than him. I'm the best welterweight in the world. And there's nobody that's going to beat me. Whoever stepped in that cage with me, no matter what time it was on that day, was going to lose that fight. So I'm happy that these guys keep doing it because it keeps fueling me. It just keeps giving me that motivation to go harder. It keeps giving me that motivation to to not be happy with myself. You know how they say don't pat your back too too much on your uh, on your victories and you know don't cry too much on, on your losses because the sport is so quick. It turns there's so many quick uh, ups and downs in the sport. We've seen so many guys that looked untouchable, unbeatable, and then all of a sudden they can't win a fight. We we saw the guys that had crazy runs and crazy years. And it's like, where did this come from? It's like, that's how quick the sport is. And if you let your losses take over your mind or you let your wins take over your mind, like 
you're never going to be, you're never going to enjoy the journey. And for myself now, it's just about enjoying the journey and just keep proving the haters wrong. Yeah. When you look at Shavkat, I mean, again, he has been dominant. He has been good. And I know, you know, when you're preparing for him, you're preparing like you're about to fight Godzilla. Like you're preparing for the absolute best guy that you've ever fought. But I know you look at Shavkat, even when we talked about him after you beat Leon Edwards, you said, yes, you're like, you're not going to deny he's not good. He is good. But I know you see holes in that game. And I know that's what you and your coaches are doing right now. Like you're in a lab right now, like breaking him down. And I'm, I, I'm not going to ask you to give me his weaknesses, but I imagine you've seen that, like studying him, you've already seen things that you can expose yeah 100 percent. like i i watch every single fighter before they even get into the before i even have to face them right i know what i'm going to do how i would fight them and i always have just like a game plan basically for everybody in my division um and for him like I, obviously i've been paying attention to him i knew he was on the rise i knew he was coming up and then i always just like love watching guys that fought guys that i fought already right he just fought wonder boy and I like to see what he did and how I did it and, you know, to see if he took the same route as me or a different route. So, yeah, he's he has, a, to me, to me in my eyes, I see him with a lot of weaknesses. But he also, like you said, he has strengths, right? It's one of his biggest strengths, I think, is his mentality. A lot of people and a lot of fighters in this game, they, they get to, like, breaking points. And I saw that with Leon Edwards. But with Shafka, I don't see, a, like, a breaking point in him. I see, like you said, I'm looking at him like, Everybody calling him the, the Robocop, this, this, and that, the, the boogeyman. I have to look at him like that, like he's unbreakable, that I have to, like, put his lights out for him to go to sleep. And that's the mindset I'm taking in this fight. This is going to be the toughest guy that I, I've ever fought. That's my mindset. There's nothing in here that's going to make it easy. There's nothing in here that's going to – there's nothing – I can't go in here with the mindset that, right, I'm on, I'm on top right now. I did all this. I looked the best I ever looked my last fight. No, I got to be better than the last guy that I was. Yeah, and we talked about it, you know, when you said it before the Leon Edwards fight, you said you wanted to go out there and beat him over five rounds, and I said, I understood that mentality because sometimes it's actually better to beat a guy over five rounds because there's no question, right? Like, there's no, there's no, you know, oh, you got a lucky punch or, oh, you caught him in a guillotine. Like, you beat him over five rounds. He had every opportunity over 25 minutes to try to get a comeback. This guy's never done that. He's never even gone 15 minutes. Like, is there part of you that says, like, I, I don't want to say easiest path to victory, but is there part of you thinking, like, if this fight does go deep in the third, into the fourth, into the fifth, that's a whole world he's never even experienced. Like, he's never seen that. He has no idea what it's like. Yeah, I think in general, he's never seen anybody like me. He's never fought anybody. He's like they're intimidated when they go in a cage with them. Like you've seen guys that will just sit there and I feel like they just fall down or they'll just like throw a kick and they're like afraid to throw or hit him. And then they just like end up falling backwards or they throw something at him. He takes it and they're just like, all right, well, dang, they didn't knock him out. All right, take my neck, throw it this way. Like they're looking for ways out with them. Now you're going to fight somebody that's in there. That's the toughest guy you ever fought. Somebody that's in there. That's tougher than you. Somebody that, you know, that's going to push you to your, your next level. And, are you willing to go to that next level? There's not a lot of guys that are willing to go to the next level. There's not a lot of guys that are get to the fourth round. They're out of breath. They're, 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 they're choking, they're dying. And they still have a little bit more in the gas tank. That's what separates the contenders from the champions. And he's never felt that he's never had to see that. So now the first time you're going to see that is in the cage with me. That's going to be a nightmare. Yeah. But you know, like I said, you already know, you go out there and you can 50, 43, this guy, and someone's going to say, well, oh, he just wasn't ready. He was you already know, like, I just hate it, but you know, that's what's going to happen. Like, I love that you're already prepared for that though. I know it's already coming. Like you're going to win and and that's going to be the first thing they're going to say to you. Yeah, 100%. But for myself, I'm looking at it too, like this, right? The last undefeated juggernaut that I fought, I knocked out and that's what I do. It, it pushes me to another level when I know that I'm fighting these guys that they say is unbeatable. So uh, my mindset is going in there and I'm going for the finish, right? He finishes everybody. So now let's go for the finish. Let, let me show you that I can finish him. Let me show you what, what, what happens to these, the guys that the Superman's of the division when they go against the, the, the real, the Batman of the division, right? Yeah. Now I know you never go into any fight below. I think it's going to be easy. You've never gone into any fight thinking, I'm just going to roll through this guy. You're confident, of course, but I know just like when you fought Gilbert and when you fought anybody else, you say, Hey, this is going to be a war. This is going to be five rounds of hell. You know that going into it. Um, but I made this argument the other day on my podcast, bro. I said, you know, Shavkat is good. Like, no one's going to deny the guy is really good. But I said, if you get through Shavkat, everything goes well in December, you beat Shavkat. 
I think I'm not saying when I use the word easier, I don't want to be disrespectful, but like <laughs> you could argue that this is your toughest fight because like everyone else, I could see a, a, a much different. Like this one is a, is an intriguing fight because he is a very well rounded guy, he's a good finisher, things like that. But like I see a path to victory over Jack Della Maddalena. I see a very path, a very clear path to victory over Ian Gary. Could you argue that this actually might be your toughest test as far as like being welterweight champion right now? <laughs> I mean, your next fight is always your toughest fight, right? I always just have that mindset, no matter who's next to you, who's in front of you, because like we've seen at the end of the day, even with the Alex Pereira fight against Roundtree, right? And Roundtree had great moments in that fight. And whether your people are looking at it, like, look at the rankings, this guy's number eight and going, and there's no way he's going to walk, he's going to walk through him. It's easy fight. I, nobody's easy because this game is just, there's so many ways to lose. There's so many ways to get caught. So I never want to underestimate anybody, even with this fight. For Shavka, I see a lot of holes in this fight. And I honestly, I see a lot of more holes in, it, in him than a lot of these other guys in, in the division when I'm thinking about them and I'm looking at them. Um, but I have to I have to go out there and I have to perform. I have to go out there and I have to exploit those holes. So it's it's all on me. Anybody, my, my toughest opponent is myself. The only person that's ever going to beat me, the only person that's uh, good enough to beat me is me. So if I'm in there and I, I'm at my best version, I'm, on, I'm at mentally where I'm supposed to be at my body's where it's supposed to be at. There's nobody in the world that's going to be me except for myself. Yeah. Now I know your full focus. 110% right now is only Shavkat Rachmanov. It's only December 7th. It's only in Vegas, but I got to ask why is uh, the featherweight champion chirping at you? I'm so confused about this whole thing. I think they do got like Napoleon syndrome or something. The short guys, they always act like they're tough. Uh, but literally I think he started coming at me because somebody asked me about, why is he coming at Islam? And I said, bro, he needs to focus on Holloway, who's in front of him, because – and you don't want to disrespect the guys from Dagestan because they see you in person, they're going to slap you, right? They, they don't take that stuff – they don't play the, the trash talk game. It's like – it's real life for them. And I think he took offense to it, but he's at that mode, right, where he's – I think he's still trying to find himself and he's trying to show fans that he's this trash talker and he's this bad guy. Um, he's not really good at trash talking, so – when he comes at me, I'm just like, it's laughable because he's like basically copying words off memes. Um, but at the end of the day, it's like, we're not going to fight in the cage. So like, why are you even giving me the, the, those words? You're trying to talk tough because you know, nothing's really going to come of it. And he could say, oh man, I want to go up to 170 and be a triple champ after this. But you, you know, you're not, I don't think he's going to get past Holloway. I think he's going to lose this fight. And then we don't even have to hear his freaking mouse voice. I was going to ask, so I assume you're picking Max Holloway to win this fight. <laughs> At least rooting for Max Holloway to win this fight. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm rooting for Max, but I also, skill-wise, I think Max will beat him. I think he goes out there and, you know, he pushes a lot of these guys forward, and a lot of the guys he's fought were, like, shorter. Max is a, a taller boxer. He hasn't fought somebody like him. And Max is a – we know how good Max's chin is. And I think that he's going to realize once it gets to the, the third, fourth, and fifth round – that Max is still there. Max is still in front of him. We saw him get a little bit tired kind of in the MF fight. Um, and I think he's going to get worse in this fight because Max is high volume. And he showed last fight his working on power. I think Max will uh, keep his lights up. Yeah, I mean, I know it was a couple of fights ago. I think people kind of forget that fight he had with Jai Herbert at Lightweight. Like, Jai's a big, you know, tall guy. That was dicey for a little bit. He came back and won, but that was a dicey fight until he got him. 100%. We saw him get dropped. We saw him. He takes a lot of damage. He gets hit a lot. Uh, and I know that people will say, oh, he knocked out Volkanovski. But Volkanovski just got knocked out by uh, Islam a couple months before that. It's like you got to look at the circumstances of how he's done the, what he's done. And the, uh, like you never want to take anybody wins away from anybody. Never, right? I'm not going to – I'm not never going to hate on him. Obviously, he has good boxing. I just think that for himself, he's, he's puffing up his chest a little bit too much. And he's talking about other divisions when he's still going to fight you. I'm going to give Volk a rematch. You can take a Lopez. We can start talking about double champ status. Yeah, absolutely. Now, 
let me go back to what we kind of joked about at the very beginning, which is this Kamara Usman thing, because I know you guys were – it's funny. I interviewed your manager, Ali Abdel Aziz, obviously he manages both of you, and I said I said to him, I said, listen, I know they're going back and forth, but I think there's a mutual respect. And Ali goes, I don't know if there is a lot of mutual respect, actually. So, like, do you feel like – like, obviously, I think the re- the reason why it's not – it's obviously the run that Shavka has on why he's getting it, but I think that, you know, we made the argument when we talked back in July. I said – I love Kamara. I think he's an incredible champion, but he's on a, a losing streak. I think he needs to get a win before he would get a title shot. Is there a part of you that's like you hope he does get a win? Just because I know there's like I know you would love to add that name to your resume. And the back, I'll be honest, the back and forth has been fun. Like you going to you going to Usman has been a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, one hundred percent. I hope he does go out there and he fights one of these guys and he gets a win, right? Because uh, he is a big name in the division. He is a, a a former champion that people look up to and. and think he's one of the the best to ever do that welterweight so for sure and i and i love go i love fights with a buildup like that where i can go back and forth with somebody and make in front of them and there there is something there right obviously with the shop cuts there's really not much there it's you know there's mutual respect so i'm not going to create any drama or create any hate when the, it's it'll just be fake it's not authentic i think the fight's good enough to sell itself but with the usman it'll be fun because I know there will be a back and forth. With the Leon, there was no really a back and forth because Leon really doesn't talk. But Usman, he'll chirp back and forth with you. Yeah, you guys, and you guys did this podcast episode that's never seen the light of day, right? Like, I've never, there's, it never saw the light of day. It probably will never get released, right? Yeah, I think uh, Usman, like, buried it in the backyard or something like that. I think they need a, they, somebody needs to dig it up and, uh, and post it. I don't know where they're going with it. Oh man, yeah, what a what a wild thing. Yeah, I think that's like one that like it would make a lot of sense. But I I think you know everyone understands he's got to get back on the win you know win streak win track before that could happen. But uh, it just like there's some it's like with you and Connor. Like I always joke about you and Connor when you have fun with him on Twitter. Like it just seems like some guys you have fun going after. It seems like Usman's one of those guys. Oh, of course, yeah. I, I love anybody that I'm gonna get a rise out of, right? Because you could tell he takes it personally. He takes everything personally. He, he was a, you were a champion and, and you lost your belt. Now you're on a losing streak. And now that you got the guy that's better than you, the guy that's had the belt, the guy that's in your division on top, and he's on your podcast that you invited him to. So he, some people, their egos are too big. They can't sit there and be a professional about it. And I think with him, it's like, he's so used to going back and forth with Kobe. Who's not really good at talking. He's not, he's just stupid. He's not clever with anything. So when you got somebody that's intelligent and that could treat you, and make you look dumb. It's like, dang, he got me. He got the belt, and he got me with words. Ah, I need to do something. I need to do something to get to to change the the rhythm of this whole thing. Would you? Here's the question: Would you invite him to be on Remember the Show? Would he get an invitation to be on your show? Oh, of course. It's the Champ Show. Anybody can come on the Champ Show? Uh, we'll have fun with it. Like it, it's a game show, right? For for us. So I'll make it easy for him. I'll, I'll do like big pictures and easy words for him to to know about easy questions so he can answer. <laughs> and I know like every time we talk, I have to, I always bring up Connor because your Connor tweets are like the most iconic thing. Like you, you'll I can't really, what's up with the tweets? You're just like, you're like, man, these referees are tough, but just remember Connor McGregor sucks and he hasn't won in like five or whatever. Those are the, and when Connor comes to you, it's always funny because I'm like, Oh, here we go. We get to see Bilal come back at him. Uh, but the reality <laughs> is I think you agree with me on this. And I, I, listen, this isn't a knock on Connor, but like, do you think I because I think a lot of people think this now like have we seen the last of him like do you think that's done like do you think we'll ever see him actually not you I don't think he's gonna fight you but like in general yeah. do you think we'll ever see him fight again no I don't think we'll ever see him fight again it's I think it, the the fight game has really passed him up and even with himself like you could just look at him where any event we see him at he's either high or drunk or doing something crazy then he'll post uh a weird video of him like sparring somebody at a cardio kickboxing class and so the people make a big view of it and say, look at Connor to put out sparring video. And it's like, bro, come on, chill out. He looks, he looks slow. He looks old. He looks like a bodybuilder. Now uh, there's nothing there for him. Maybe a, a, one of these older guys, maybe they give him like a Tony Ferguson or somebody. So he get to finally get a win. Uh, but somebody now that's in that division, if, if he really wants to be a champion, he really wants to get his name back up there. It's just too much work, work for him to come out. 
The argument I've heard, and I've heard a couple of people say this, is that he just can't let it go, right? Like, some guys just can't let it go, like, let go of the fame, let go of the, you know, because that's who you're known as, right? Like, he got known as Conor McGregor, the UFC champion. Some guys just can't let that go. And it seems like that's what I've heard some people say is, like, he's just holding on because he doesn't want to let that part of his identity go. Yeah, and, I like, it, it's kind of, like, sad, right? Because you have all the money in the world, you act like you're you're happy, it's like the the fake Instagram posts from people, right? Where they show the the good stuff in their life, but deep down inside, they're like crying. And I think that's what it's from him. He sees all these guys getting attention, and it's always when there's a big fight announced or a big fight happens when he puts out a tweet and he and he says his you know his stupid little spiel of you know this guy is amazing or I'll knock out this guy. I have two left hands for this, blah blah blah. And then the world bites on it and they give him all the attention, and then he thinks that he's back in the game, but this game it isn't like that, right? You can't win fights with words. You can't win fights like that uh, with just tweets. You have to put the work in. You have to sweat. And he doesn't have that sweat and that work ethic anymore. There's not that hunger anymore for him there. But you kind of, like, feel bad, right? Because at what point do you, like, all right, bro, now you're just, like, that guy that's at the gym, uh, the basketball courts, wearing a, a jersey and a headband and the armband. And acting like you can still make the NBA. That that's where Connor is right now. He goes, shows up to the, the UFC gym, probably with his belt on his shoulder, and he's shadow boxing and he's looking at everybody and telling all these kick, cardio kickboxing moms that he was a champion once and he's just trying to get attention from them. Yeah. Um, real quick before I get you out of here, Bilal, I know obviously one thing I loved about your win, uh, and obviously Juliana's win as well, is like your team finally getting some shine. I've talked to Coach Mike Valley before, incredible coach, very quiet guy. He's not the guy who does a ton of interviews and things like that. But can I ask, because I know your last camp you did get a chance to work with Khabib and those guys. Is there any plan to work with those guys before you fight Shavkat? Uh, no, I think it's during, uh, they're going to be in Dubai. I don't think they're going to come out here until probably late November. So if they're coming out here earlier than, than November, hopefully we'll get uh, uh, some work in with those guys. But, yeah, like I've spoken with Habib and stuff, and, yeah, they're going to just be out there. I don't know when they're going to come back. I know Islam's going to probably do his camp out here if he's going to fight in January. Um, but hopefully they'll be out here for the fight. So just their good energy, their positive energy, is just going to give me motivation regardless. And having, hey, even if it's just a little advice from me, man, that guy seems to know what he's doing, man. He knows his stuff. I'm sure he'll give you a little breakdown on Shavkat. <laughs> Oh, 100%, right? Any type of words I get from Habib is, is priceless. Any type of mindset. He watches tape, he'll look at you, and he'll just like, do this, this, and that. And he may, he simplifies everything. And it's just like, it, it like takes away, honestly, like a lot of the stresses and the fears most fighters have. Because you have the guy that, who I think is the best to, to do it. And he's just like, oh, all you got to do is this, this, and this. And then after your fight, you're like, oh, he was right. Is like you you overthink so much stuff in your head, right? In your imagination, you're gonna you're gonna this is gonna happen, that can happen, this can happen, and then he says this, and you're like, bro, he just made it seem so easy, made it seem so simple, uh, and that's the best part about him. I love it. I love it. Well, Bilal, man, I cannot wait. I know you're excited. December 7th, finally get to defend that title for the first time. I'm so excited to get to headline this event. A little closer. Listen, no, no time. You remember, three hours time difference, though, Bilal. Be careful. Three hours time difference. Or two hours, I guess, from Chicago. Two hours time difference. Be careful. Yeah, man. I got I to gotta make sure that the time doesn't affect uh, either one of us. And, you know, I got to make sure my alarm clock set. I got to get my sleep coach going. <laughs> Bilal, it's always a pleasure, man. Obviously, have a great training camp, man. Safe travels out to Vegas in December. Cannot wait to see you back in action defending that title. And as always, thank you for giving me some time, man. You know I appreciate it. Always, brother. Appreciate you, man.